12th day of November, 2018, allegedly according to that thing we call a calendar, and this indeed is the Ocelli Effect, broadcast live from the facilities of Ocelli.com, but also heard in a variety of other places. I do want to uh, quickly acknowledge our listeners over at Shake and Wake Radio, because I do know that this show is replayed various times repeatedly over there, and I want to welcome you to the discussion. Anyway, there's a lot of other places it's available. Do appreciate it. Now, Apple has been giving us some trouble but more on that in shows later this week, I assure you. It is a moon day or a Monday night, and we're kicking off the broadcast week the way we should with Jordan Maxwell. Now, Jordan has been doing this series with us about the major religions and religion in general on this topic, and we are on episode 14 now. <laughs> uh, it is uh, it is amazing the amount of uh, information that we've been able to cover, even in those previous 13 episodes, but, uh, but there is yet more to go into. And, of course, if you really want to study more, then I would suggest going over to jordanmaxwellshow.com. Now, that's all together. You put Jordan Maxwell, no dot, no separation. Jordan Maxwell and show, again, no dot, no separation. JordanMaxwellShow.com. That is the only website which is Jordan Maxwell's. Meanwhile, when you go there, you can easily find something called a research society, the Jordan Maxwell Research Society. It is something that you have to join. You get behind it. It's not that expensive. You can easily do that and dig deeper into not only the topic we're covering tonight, but a great many other areas of study, including the monetary system, governments in general, uh, you know, language in and of itself, the control mechanisms that are out there in various ways, and there is constantly new content being added. In addition, there's also videos which one can stream straight from the website for just a couple of bucks, and they're all yours. You don't have to get them mailed to you. You don't have to search them out, and they are directly uh, coming from the source, Jordan Maxwell himself. A lot of other places claim a lot of things, but jordanmaxwellshow.com is, again, the only website that is actually Jordan Maxwell's. All right, so all of that now out of the way. <laughs> Jordan, <laughs> I, I, I'm going to repeat some of that later, just spoiler alert for those of you listening, but Jordan, first of all, how are you tonight, sir? I think okay. <clears throat> we'll find out as we go along, I guess. <laughs> I, th I think I'm doing all right for a 78-year-old man. Uh, you know, th th this is true, and uh, I I'm so glad to have you along. Now, now, before we went to air, Jordan was reminding me about what Steve Allen used to say, and he was a funny and intelligent guy. A lot of people don't know that, but he really was. Uh, he was extraordinarily intelligent. He wrote so many books. I think it was like 25 or 28 books mm -hmm. that Steve Allen wrote about philosophies, science, uh, religion, theologies. He was an extraordinarily brilliant man, and he had some incredibly one-liners. He used to say there were two kinds of there are two kinds of facts in the world, the kind you look up and the kind you make up. And I'm tired of listening to people who make up stories. And uh, I thought that was interesting. Well, you know, and, this this is true, Jordan, and, and, and it is extremely interesting. Now, today is the day that we find out that uh, Stan Lee is no longer uh, with us on this planet, it seems. And he is, of course, the guy who created uh, many uh, mythological, interesting things, entire universes, worlds, so on and so forth through the comic book medium. Um, and there are a lot of people who are hypercritical of that sort of thing. I got to tell you, though, Jordan, in my mind, and I said this uh, on, on social media earlier, I don't know if people took to it very well, but I said, you know, Someday it could be that someone will create a religion out of what it is that Stan Lee created for the sake of a comic book, and it would not be all that much different than what it is we have today, although the characters might be a little more colorful. Uh, and, you know... <laughs> I tend to think you're right. That's what, well, that's what we have today. We have religions, very big, powerful religions, which are based on the same kind of foundation on on characters that never lived, on on you know ideas and stories that were made up uh, purposely, politically made up to uh, to mislead whole nations of people, politically 
for for political reasons. And uh, so it wouldn't surprise me if we have religions based on some of Stan Lee's work. And incidentally, the man who was was uh, representing Stan Lee in his uh, legal proceedings and the legal problems Stan Lee was having was identical to mine. And his his attorney I have talked with, <clears throat> uh, who was representing Stan Lee, also understands my situation. Mm-hmm. And uh, and so I, I you know I didn't know Stan Lee was having the exact identical same problem that I have been living under for some eight years. Yes, and it, it, so it, that's that's interesting. Stan Lee was an incredible man, and then he gave us so much. Right. Uh, the, uh, there was so much to make movies and television shows and all kinds of fun things that he was into that I think is based on some very serious kind of research that needs to be done on some of the subjects he dealt with. Mm. No, I absolutely concur, and uh, it is notable, in case the listener is not aware, uh, Stan Lee was confronted with a situation where effectively somebody stole his property out from under him, uh, effectively taking away a lot of his power to even conduct business or ever on. You know, a lot of people don't know about this kind of stuff. They think about him as the, you know, the grand master of the Marvel Universe, so to speak. But uh, but at all times, you know, when when somebody uh, uh, is is trusting of the wrong people, all of a sudden things can be taken away from you. And Stan Lee certainly uh, endured a similar situation. Now I don't want to get into it too deeply with you tonight, Jordan. But if if people know what's going on, there's a reason why I'm telling you. Only go to jordanmaxwellshow.com, and right. I'm going to leave it there unless you want to talk about it, Jordan. But. We have many other topics to tackle, so uh, up to you as to what direction we're going to go in tonight. Uh, certainly, I've heard from the listeners a bit, and I want to uh, enter what it is they've had to say into the conversation. But uh, Stan Lee, again, uh, uh, it, it might seem silly to some people to uh, sort of venerate somebody who was a, a comic book guy or whatever, but... Uh, an amazing amount of contribution to the uh, to the popular culture, but also uh, in, in a very esoteric well, sort of way. There's a yeah, lot more to, to Hollywood, it. into Hollywood, and mm-hmm. big business, entertainment, big business. You know, he was he was uh, he was extraordinarily successful in translating. Uh, all the, all of the wonderful, strange stories and strange ideas he came up with that were brought into Hollywood and made it very popular. And around the world, people enjoyed movies that, that are based on Stan Lee's work. Mm-hmm. So Hollywood really uh, you know, used him. They made uh, lots of money off of him. And you've got to know that if Hollywood's making millions and millions of dollars off of you, you must be important. And and that's what happened with Stan Lee is that he was the author of so much, so much that we are now today seeing and entertaining us in Hollywood. So, Mm. uh, what his his contributions were mega big, and unfortunately, uh, you know, unfortunately, when you get older, you tend to trust people, and sometimes you have to trust them. Because you're put in a position where you have to do something, you have to trust somebody, and when you trust them, when and in Hollywood they will rip you off and tear you apart, and lie and cheat you in court and take your money, they take your company, they take everything you've done, and steal it all. Mm-hmm. And they figure you're an old man, you're you know you're like eighty or ninety years old. What are you going to do? If they steal everything from you, they will get it all, and you're going to die anyway, so you don't need it where you're going, and they're going to take everything. So that happens in Hollywood a lot. That happens in the world a lot. Mm. You know, People coming into your company purposely coming in, patting you on the back and with a knife in their hand. They're going to cut your throat as soon as they can. They, they they build you up as a great friend. They tell you how much they love what you're doing, and they want to help you. And if you are old man and you trust them, 
to help you. They will help you. They will cut your throat and drain your blood and take everything you own and leave you for dead. That's the world we live in today. Mm. Well, absolutely. And, you know, uh, it was a very intelligent man who I will not name, but I did have a lot of contact with that people would be surprised I had a lot of contact with a few years ago. He is now gone. Uh, but uh, but he once told me, I guarantee you one thing in life, uh, young friend, <laughs> and yeah. that is that uh, if an assassin will come for you, he will be smiling at you when he comes. That's right. uh, and this is this is a truth that I've kept very close to me at all times. I'm sharing it with you guys, not telling you who it was, but it was a guy who knew a little something about assassination. Let's mm-hmm. leave it at that. Um, Jordan, so. I'd like to get directly into it. I thought it was definitely worthy of a a little bit of discussion about Stan Lee and his contributions. And who knows, you know, again, I would not be shocked to uh, if if I were able to travel 200 years into the future and the human family were to survive past this particular precarious, turbulent time. uh, I would not be surprised 200 years in the future to see the Church of Spider-Man somewhere. Uh, you know, and this kind of thing because these legends which this man created and, uh, and helped others create, uh, were, are, are, are that deep, are that thick, are that realistic that quite honestly, uh, it would not be difficult to build a religion off of them had you not known that they originated in, you know, books that were meant to entertain children to begin yep. with. But. Yeah, well, it's still entertaining the children of the world today. Mm. And, and, yeah, it's called and, religion. Right, and here we go, because religion in and of itself uh, appears to be a, you know, in its current form, Jordan, because I can't yeah. speak to what it looked like thousands of years ago exactly. It is difficult to get that history. Um, That's right. But I can say that today it appears to be uh, a derivative of something that started out, you know, without the benefit of the printing press, but in a very similar fashion to what Stan Lee did. Now, again, I want to enter the listeners, uh, uh, you know, feedback into the conversation. I know you enjoy that. And, of course, if you guys go to the live chat room, uh, I will enter any questions into the discussion here tonight. If you're on my Skype list and wish to text me a message to ask a question of Jordan or to make a comment, I at all times stop the conversation to bring those things in when it's appropriate. So feel free to deliver us some feedback. Of course, you can always email Jordan. Uh, over at his website, jordanmaxwellshow.com. Follow the directions. There's a contact there. Jordan enjoys that, and I enjoy your your emails at info at ocelli.com. Either way, if you talk to one of us in a future show or during this show, uh, we will enter your ideas and questions into the conversation. Um, so one thing that I took from recent feedback outside of some praise, uh, which we've gotten from as far away as Ireland, and as uh, close by as a couple of counties away from where I'm sitting right now, uh, an overall thing came up, and that is that uh, we have mentioned Islam, talking about the three major religions, what a lot of people call the Abrahamic religions, and you certainly tackled how, well, that's an interesting device to say that's where it came from, considering it's supposed to be a man who a Brahmin might might or might not have existed, but the actual Abraham character is one thing. However, they have asked uh, that uh, we, we, we seem to have only alluded to Islam and not really delved into it a bit. And I wonder if we could go a little deeper into Islam tonight, because it seems as though the listeners feel as though we passed it by a lot. Um, you certainly talked about how it is a moon cult and uh, uh, looking at it, looking at its symbols, looking at, you know, just the face value of its symbols. I mean, there is a crescent moon here, which is <laughs> something to be yeah. kept in mind. The Quran, we've talked about a few times. Uh, but, but honestly, I think you're right that we haven't really spent a good deal of time unpacking Islam a bit. And, uh, it is a, a, a serious factor when you're talking about this triad of uh, modern Western religions and the class of, clash, excuse me, of civilizations that we see being uh, not only utilized but implemented by those mm-hmm. that wish to uh, promote conflict on the planet. So Islam is a factor, and I wonder if you wouldn't, uh, you know, give us a, a bit of your 
collected knowledge and wisdom about it specifically. And, uh, you know, just for this particular episode, maybe we could hover on that and see where it goes. Well, I the only reason I haven't talked that much about it is because I don't know that much about it, uh, even though I've been looking at it for many years. But I'm not as interested in, in digging into its past as I am into something that I do relate to, and that is uh, Christianity and Judaism. But I do think it's interesting that it was brought up many years ago to me that there, why is there three major religions? <clears throat> there are three major Abrahamic religions. And we know that Abraham was originally called Abram, not Abraham. And Abram was from what we call the Iraq, uh, from that area we today would refer to as Iraq. And there's a reason why there's a war in Iraq because of the Abraham Abrahamic religion. I would say to the world listening to us, if you're really interested in in the history of uh, of Islam, keep in mind to do some research on the web if you can. Do some research in books in the library on the major religions of the world being corporations. They were set up as a business, corporations. And uh, you know, then you will find that Islam is like Christianity, is like the Vatican. They have their own Vatican. They have their own seat of power on the earth. In the Middle East, and the Jews have their own seat of power in the Middle East. And the Roman Empire was dominant over both the Jewish and the Islamic Empire. And uh, today, I think that all three major religions are nothing more than corporations. They're companies, and this is why uh, in, Judea, in Christianity we have the different churches, and the different churches, the different philosophies carrying Christianity, or we call Christianity, we refer to them as different denominations. That's a term which is used in counting money. Mm-hmm. Fives and tens and twenties and fifties and hundreds are denominations, and that's what they call churches, different denominations. Why? Because churches are a religion. Uh, the churches not only are a religion, but they are a business. They are corporations. And the very basis for business and corporation originated in the Western world, in Europe. This is where the idea of corporations came from, going back to the Roman Empire. They understood how to incorporate a business. And they did that with the Roman religion, what we call the Roman universal religion, the religion of the Roman Empire. But the word universal in Latin is Catholic. Catholic means universal. So therefore, air is Catholic. Water is Catholic. People are Catholic. Anything which is found everywhere in the world is, the word is, universal is Catholic. And so therefore, as I said, anything that you see all over the earth is Catholic. And so we see the imprint of the ancient Roman Empire today all over the world is called the Roman Catholic Church, which is translated from the original to being the Roman universal Roman religion of Rome. And we still have the Caesars of Rome are still here with us today. The Caesars of Rome were referred to as Pontifex Maximus. Caesar was referred to as Pontifex Maximus. Pontiff was a bridge builder. People who built bridges were referred to as Pontiff. Pontiff bridge builders and therefore the maximum bridge builder was the Pontifex Maximus. And this is what the, we call the Pope today. Well, that was a term which was used to dis, to uh, determine Caesar, was referred to as the Pontifex Maximus, the great bridge builder, the maximum bridge builder. What are you talking about bridge building? 
I'm talking about the fact that when Caesars of Rome would send in their troops into another country, they would take over that country. They allowed that country, once they took them over, they would allow them to become citizens of Rome. They were under Roman law. They were under the Roman Caesars. But they could have their own religion and their own philosophies and their own cultures. And they could do things the way they've always done it. As long as you remember, Caesar is God, period. He is the ultimate authority over your country, over your customs, over your people, over everything you've ever done in your own country. Caesar is now God, period. And therefore, you can believe whatever you want and do business the way of whatever you want, do whatever you wish to do, what you've always done, as long as you remember who the boss is. And so that's the way it works today. The the whole idea is that no matter what country you are the head of, no matter what position you hold in your country and a particular uh, presidents or princes or or you know, or or the royalty uh, must go to Rome eventually. You must go to Rome, just like it's you are supposed to go to Mecca. You know, uh, once in your lifetime, or once in your lifetime, no matter who you are, no matter how important you are, you should go to Rome and bow down on your knees before the Pope and kiss his ring, just to show Caesar that you accept him as your absolute master. And you can go back home and run your country the way you think you want to and do what you want to do within your country as long as you go on your knees and you kiss the ring of your master. And so the Roman Empire today still exists. We call it the Vatican. And and where is the Vatican? In Rome. That's where Caesar was, in Rome. And Washington, D.C. was nothing more than a part, that 10 miles square that is referred to today as Washington, D.C., was originally a part of a large tract of land that was owned by the Carroll family. The Carroll family was a Catholic Jesuit family in the colonies who happened uh, to be the owner of the property we call United States of America today, the Washington, D.C., was a part of the property owned by John C. Carroll. And he was a Catholic, and he was the wealthiest man in the colonies at that time. From what I can see about him in history, he was the wealthiest man in North America at the time of the American Revolution. And he was very close friends with George Washington and was on the side of the colonies that wanted to break away from England and he helped finance the Revolutionary War for George Washington and afterwards afterwards George Washington was given a 10 mile plot of land on on John C. Carroll's property and to set up what he called the, the government of the United States of America so today We go back in history and look at the history of Washington, D.C., and you will find that when it was in the when it was in the possession of John C. Carroll, that area was called Rome. John Carroll's uh, property was called Rome in in the uh, colonies. So Washington, D.C. was originally called Rome, and today it is the center of the Roman Empire. This is why you will see in Washington, D.C., they have a Senate. And if you go back and read the history of the Roman Empire, Caesar ruled Rome, and he ruled the empire from the Roman Senate. And the Senate was on a hill in Rome. They had the building for the Senate was on a hill in Rome. It was called Capitoline Hill. And so today in Washington, D.C., John C. Carroll's property, uh, there is something called Washington, D.C., up on the hill. It's called Capitoline Hill or Capitol Hill. 
So we are today living in a North America under the Roman Empire. And this is why New York, when Rome moved into Britannia, when the Caesars of Rome moved into the island of the of the U, UK, what we call the UK, the United uh, Kingdom, when Rome moved into the UK, it, they set up their base of operations to control the island for Caesar. And the place where Caesar set up his government was in York, England. York, England was a center for the Roman Empire in in Britain. And so today, uh, it it only follows that we have something called New York. And New York is the empire state. It's the state of the new Roman Empire. The empire state. They even have a building called the Empire State Building. This is why in New York, the empire state, you have a large statue sitting in the in the water uh, as you come into the port of New York you will see a statue of liberty the statue of liberty is not the statue of freedom the statue of liberty is what it says it is it's a statue of liberty liberty means you ask permission you get a license you pay a fine you get a ticket you are under submission to a higher power. When you come into this country, you are under the Roman Empire, the new, profoundly powerful Roman Empire. <clears throat> and New York is the empire's state. The center for the Roman Empire on the earth today, New York. And this is where you get into the religions And the most important and powerful politicians in this country, you know, were were being directed, financed, organized, and directed by the Roman secret societies, the Roman cults of the Roman Empire that are here, that are operating in our country today. The people of America, we call ourselves Americans, but we're not. We're Romans. Mm. Well, you know, Jordan, this leads to an interesting question, because trying to study history previous to what people would uh, uh, call the rise of the Roman Empire in history, um, there there was a couple of other empires that seemed to behave in exactly the same fashion, Mm -hmm. uh, which include the, you know, the stories related to Alexander the Great. That's right. right. Uh, he did precisely what you described, conquering different places, but then allowing them to keep their religion. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, and look, you can keep your religion as long as you understand you're bowing down to my standard. Uh, That's right. You, you can keep it. And matter of fact, we'll take the kings of those areas. We'll turn them into governors of sorts. And they are rulers now in my stead. Alexander did this before it, the, the, the typical thoughts about the rise of the Roman Empire. Also, even uh, the the empire which Alexander did battle with and did subvert, according to the history I'm able to read, the uh, the Persian Empire. Uh, yep. You know, m- notable people are like uh, Darius or Darius, depending on how you pronounce it, and Xerxes, his son, uh, whom uh, did battle with Alexander, literally. But they had assembled a massive empire which came from the east and seemed to behave in the same way. We will uh, uh, subjugate the rulers of these lands and turn them into our subjects, therefore making them part of our lands, so to speak. Um, right. Which, is this a function of empire that the Romans then took and perfected, or was this the real predecessor of what was to come in Rome and simply didn't have a headquarters just yet? It's kind of an interesting uh, uh, question, isn't it? Well, of course it is, but I think that's answer. the answer is kind of obvious. Even babies and children, little kids in the first grade are very selfish. You know, they want they want to play the game the way they want to play it, and they want to own everything themselves, and they want things to go their way. And then when you get a bunch of children together, there's going to be all kinds of arguments and and fights, and that's why adults have to go in and settle it. And, and make sure that all the children have a say in what's going on and you don't have one child 
who's going to overpower everybody else, and it's, it's his ball, and he's going to play the game. Everybody's going to play the game the way he wants it. And that's just, it seems to be part of the human nature to want to control your environment and control your world around you. And that means you have to, first of all, control all the other humans who are like you, and they want to run things their way. So you've got to show them who the boss is like Al Capone would do. You know, he would show you, you know, you could, you could be a part of the organization, the mob. But if you get out of line and start thinking that you're the boss, you're going to be, you know, you're going to be a dead man walking. And so this seems to be the way children think. And children are simply grown up. When they grow up, they get bigger and they're older. And we call them adults, but they're still mentally children. Mm. And so they, they, we now see organized crime, syndicates, criminals who want things the way they want it. They want to do it the way they want to do it. If you don't like it, they'll kill you. They'll do whatever they can to knock you out of the picture completely so they will be in control. And we call that criminal. We call it criminal crime. Mm-hmm. And so that's why today we have so many people trying to hurt each other and and cause other people to be in subjection to them. And that's always been a problem. And so I think that that's why we have the different empires that come up, because ultimately the bottom line is what goes around comes around. When you try and take other people down, like the Bible says, be careful when you're digging a hole for your enemy that you don't fall back in it. And so you know, what goes around comes around. In other words, if you're trying to do something to hurt someone else and steal their property and steal their uh, their their life and, you know, and, and subject them to your will, be careful that you don't end up killing yourself. It might just turn on you and you're going to be in trouble one day but what you were trying to do to somebody else, you got caught up in it and you went to prison. So that's why I see happening. So many times adults try and take over somebody else's life and and cause themselves to end up in prison. So right. Well, and, and here's a fascinating we... thing about that, Jordan, because I, I often refer to the uh, the nation state that we deal with here. You know, uh, they call it America. I'm holding up air quotes for those of you listening at home. They call it America, but I, I refer to it as the American empire. And why? Because it is behaving as empires have in the past. Now, when you bring That's up right. this idea of, uh, of of gangsterism, really, uh, when it comes to these behaviors, it is a, a salient point to make. Why? Because even in the underworld, the alleged underworld, uh, this is exactly the behavior that takes place. You consolidate your power. You know, you don't, uh, you don't necessarily murder all of the people that are conducting illegal business in a certain area. You turn them over and you make them part of the organization or at least, uh, they're, they're now working for you instead of working for themselves. This is the way it's done. And, uh, I, I also believe that Michael Parenti was very accurate. Now, not necessarily in everything he said, but when he coined the phrase the gangster state and he was referring yep. to the behavior of, uh, of, of America, uh, most notably through the assassination squads and death squads and interfering with other people's lands and the way they did it and installing dictators in different places and things like that. That's what he was referring to. Um, I think it's extremely fair to recognize that uh, we do have a gangster state of sorts. Now, oh, well, on that's some what they levels, used to say about yeah. they used to say that about uh, different presidents, like uh, Bush Senior. Mm-hmm. He said that he was going to he was going to rid crime, take a crime off the streets of America. And he did just that. He did uh, take the crime, uh, all the criminal element, off the streets of America. He said he was going to do that, and he did. He brought them all into the White House and gave them a <laughs> job to work for him. Well, the, the Bush crime family's uh, model, effectively, was to do that. And he did take away some of the criminals off the streets, and that would be the criminals that didn't work for him. Uh, right. You know, so... <laughs> 
that, that that's how he chose them. And uh, it, it seems to be, again, the model, like you said, and like we talked about with the empires. Here's the thing. You notice when Jordan said that the Roman Empire would go through and adapt these different places. You keep your religion. Hey, you can even keep the guy who's in charge. It doesn't matter. Um you, you notice Jordan didn't say, well, you just have to have, uh, you know, a very moral code and get rid of these things that are. Oh, no, no, no. There, there's no consideration on that. As a matter of fact, so long as their taxes are paid, uh, the That's Roman right. Empire put up with a lot of stuff that, That's you exactly know. right. As long as you pay your taxes and you come in here and when we call you, you come in here and you are and you're respectful. And you get on your knees and you show us that you accept us as your masters, that we will, we will, you know, bring you in and uh, let you do business and we will see to it that you are protected and your business is protected and your country has, uh, gets big grants and big contracts from us and you are our friends. Like Al Capone used to say, any man who wants to be my friend, I want to be his friend. And if you if you want to if you want to be my enemy, they'll, they'll, you're going to find out who I really am. You want to be my enemy? Try it, and see what I'm see what how I will react to that. You want to be friends? Good, I'll be your friend. You want to be my enemy? I'll deal with you. Mm-hmm. And so, this is why I say that the way that America is being run today is a criminal element. It's a whole criminal element going on for power. And it was, um, it was said many years ago by, uh, by this German philosopher. I can't remember his name right now. But he said when fascism uh, re- raises its head in your country, uh, it can be quickly brought under control and eradicated. If the government itself is honest and decent, it can do what it needs to do to protect itself from the fascist element. You know, when, when the government begins to see that the criminal element is taking over, the government at that particular moment can move to get rid of that criminal element if it's, if it's honest and decent and it sees what's going on, it can get rid of its enemy and keep it clean and above and keep it clean and above board. But if it does not do anything to stop the growth of the fascist movement, one day the fascism will be so overwhelming the government has no possible way of extricating itself out of the situation. The government will not be able to stand up against the criminal element, period. It will not happen. And it said, in that particular German uh, philosopher said, and it will never, ever, if it ever takes hold, fascism ever takes hold in a major government, it will never, ever give up its position of power. It will never give it up. So once fascism has taken over, it's done. It's finished. That's what you got. That's who you are. And this is where we are today in the world we live in today. The most powerful government on the face of the earth is the Roman Empire today, <clears throat> which is the U.S., Washington, D.C., and it is purely a criminal, fascist, bloody criminal element on the earth today. And this is why today I believe there's going to be practically impossible possible to ever clean the human race up again. <clears throat> I think it's pretty much impossible to hope for a better future when the people who are in power today are mentally deranged criminals. They are they're living in a totally different world than you are. <clears throat> they don't see the world the way you see it. They don't live by the same moral codes, ethics morality or anything else. They don't have any problem with murdering a women and children. You know, <clears throat> it was just, uh, it's just a horrible situation that we are now as Americans in. We are in a mess that we cannot get ourselves out of. The problem is very simply stated. When, when you see big time criminal, uh, uh, criminality, who do you go to? You go to the law. 
and you go to the police, you go to the law enforcement to enforce the law and, and show them the criminality that's going on. And they come in with the power of government and clean up the, uh, the, the criminality put the criminals in jail and make sure everybody knows you don't do that in this country. It don't work. And so you live by the law. But if, in point of fact, it's the law that is corrupt and the lawyers are corrupt and the whole system of, of judges is corrupt, the entire system itself is corrupt, who are you going to go to to clean that up? You're going to go to the courts. The courts are the corruption. Mm. You're going to you're going to take it to the police. The police are corrupted. So if you want to turn to the government to show them the corruption, so that they can do something about it, you're going to find out the government itself is promoting the corruption. They are the criminals. And this is why all the criminality works so well is because the government goes along with it. The government's making money off of it. This is why I think it has been my my idea and my thought since back in 88 and 89 when I was giving the lectures on this subject of why we have so much criminality. I believe is my personal opinion I believe the United States federal government needs criminality. They need the criminals on the street. They need the violence. They require it. They need it. It's a part of their system to have murderers on the streets. They have It's part of their system of, of government uh, to have rapists and murderers out on the streets. That's why you go to prison. You learn how to become a really deadly criminal, and they put you back out on the street. And why would you? Why do governments need to have criminals on the streets? It's because criminals keep the they keep the people frightened. They keep the country frightened, hmm. and the, and they keep showing you television shows on television, uh, documentaries on History Channel and all the Discovery Channel. They show you what it's like in prisons. They show you what it's like to be in a gang. And what the gangs, how the gangs live in prisons and the horrible raping and killing and all the violence that goes on in prisons and mafia movies, underworld movies, all the incredible crime that the human, humans are capable of. They are telling you, here's what you're going to get if you don't go along with us. We will, if you don't, do what we tell you to do. We will find you guilty of something, and don't worry about it. We've got plenty of lawyers, and we'll find you guilty of something, and we will throw you into prison, and God help you when you go into prison. Because mm. if you're just a regular, ordinary, per working class person on the outside, you have no idea in the world what is waiting for you in a federal and state prison. <clears throat> so that's why we need the criminality. We need people to be frightened, and then we need them to be frightened in their homes. So that keeps them quiet. That keeps them docile. And uh, and so when when we have criminals that come out and blow, you know, come into a restaurant and kill fourteen people, they get a twenty five dollar fine, and they get to you know, go to court, and you never hear about them again. And then they're uh, they're out on the street. The next time, and when you get somebody who's killed 10 people, you find out, well, yeah, but he was arrested 20 years ago for killing 15 people back then. Mm -hmm. And here he is killing 10 more today. Well, where is he going? Yeah, he's probably just going to get a fine or a ticket and uh, pay a couple hundred dollar fine and or get, uh, you know, two weeks in, in a county jail, and then he's out on the street again. But you, if you don't pay your taxes or if you don't do something you're supposed to do, you'll go to prison, and God help you when you do. It's a dirty, filthy operation. This is why lawyers are referred to as criminal lawyers, mm. the American Criminal Lawyer Association, criminal lawyers. It's called the American Criminal Justice System. I've often wondered about that. Why do they call the, uh, the justice system in America, a criminal justice system. Mm -hmm. 
You think about that. American criminal justice? Yes, because the justice is administered by the criminals. And that's why there's so much, uh, so much, uh, you know, pay pe- paying people off, bribery, right. corruption, sexual bribery, all kinds of blackmailing going on in governments and, and, and courts. Why do you play, uh, how do you play tennis on a court? You know, you play tennis on a court, you play basketball on a court. It's a game. It's called the game of life. Right. You have to know how to play this game, and you have to know what this game is really all about. It's about the control of you. Well, you know, why is it important to control you? Because you have been brought up to believe that you are free, and you need to get your, you need to experience you know, understand in this country you are not free. You are living under a totalitarian fascist dictatorship. In this country of America, you are not free. Mm. So when you hear people talk about the land of the free and the home of the brave, you ain't free or brave. Well, there you, you go. And slave. it's it's really fascinating that they, they say there's two sides to the justice system. There's civil you know, and then there's criminal. Uh, right. But it's interesting that you have the civil justice system and the criminal justice system. Uh, I wonder where the justice, you know, because it seems like criminal justice would be justice for criminals. It seems like civil justice would be justice for civilians. Uh, right. hmm, yeah. Wait a minute. Does that mean <laughs> that uh, they have armies and we don't? Uh, does that also mean that there's no such thing as justice for everyone or the people or hmm right I, i've always wondered that myself and there's an interesting uh little little comment which was shot at me here um and uh look even though it's a little little negativity for me i will throw it to you jordan and you can say what you like <laughs> uh yeah. jordan is I talking probably will <laughs> like, uh, please absolutely listen it, it, it chide me or correct me because they're bringing up something i've said in the past and uh, wonder what Jordan would say to you if he knew you said this is the challenge, you know. So anyway, yeah. I, I, I'm going to put it out there, and Jordan can say whatever he likes on this show. Uh, there, there's there's no sort of agreement between Jordan and I about you can't say this, Jordan, or you can't say that, is there? None. You've never brought that up ever. Nope, not at all. So if Jordan wanted to criticize me or if Jordan wanted to uh, say something that I object to, he can at all times speak his mind any which way he likes. This is his well, time, so I just want you to know that. <laughs> but Well, the man who wrote the book, 1984, George Orwell, said, if freedom and liberty means anything, it means the right for a man to speak and, and tell people what they don't want to hear. Mm-hmm. No, and so, I'm, I'm willing to hear anything from you. So I'll, I'll give you this, a little bit of a challenge here. Uh, Jordan is talking a lot about... Uh, uh ma- I, I believe you meant to say mafiosi here, uh, John. Mm-hmm. But anyway, a lot about mafiosi uh, subjects. Chuck has said many times on his show that he has a great deal more respect for a street-level gangster than he does for politicians and those who have ascended to higher levels. <laughs> and quite honestly, he feels that the only real difference if you have a moral objection to crime between a politician is uh, a, or a politi- excuse me, a politician and a gangster in quotes, is that the politician wears a cheaper suit and has apparently gotten the approval of the controllers. Uh, yeah. Wonder what Jordan would have to say about that, considering that he is now explaining that everything is a criminal enterprise, uh, and you seem to make dif- you you seem to make differentiations between the two. Um, okay, so just in my I own say, defense, before you say that. what you like, Jordan, before yeah, you I say what you like, the question. I I feel as though there is a difference um, on occasion. And, and I've made this point on occasion when you pay the local mob boss for protection money, your place doesn't get burned down. You That's pay right. protection money to the government all the time and you have no assurances. That's the way I feel about it. But Jordan, by all means, if, if you think I'm, you know, uh, out of my mind, tell me. No, no, no. I think that is exactly right. And I understand the question. I understand why a person would ask that question. I'm just saying that it is in the nature of man, it seems to be that we're hardwired in the nature of the human 
to be selfish, self-centered, and bent toward evil. We're bent toward being bad. And the reason why is because I believe the Bible is explaining it, that the Apostle Paul says in the New Testament that there is a war. We, are, we have a war not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and against the powers of evil in this world. <clears throat> and it seems as though that there, mankind, we're told in the Bible, in the New Testament, Christianity tells us that we are two different creatures. We are the original animalistic creature, but we are also endowed with the ability to, uh, to become very spiritual. And I remember one of my teachers, professors many years ago, drew a straight line on the on the chalkboard in the class straight across and then in the middle of that line he drew a little short line up going up from that middle line and a little short one going down and then he he drew another line next to that going way up about 10 or 15 inches up from that middle line and 10 or 15 inches down from that line and he said, this is the life on the earth. Animals can only be so good. So they have a little short span to be good. But animals are simply animals. They are instinctive. They don't think about what they're going to do. They just do it. And so they can only be so bad because they're just a, a dog is a dog. He can only be so good. So he can only be so bad because he can only be what he is. They're just a dog. But. The other line is humans. We have the ability to go way down deep into dark, evil, you know, as far down into the darkness that humans are capable of doing. And we know humans are capable of a lot of dirty and evil things. But we also have the ability to go from that middle line up high. We can go all the way up into the realm of the divine. We can go up and understand and create beautiful music. We can create beautiful art. We can we can you know communicate with the great spirit in the universe, or we can go down so low that you know, that they can't get a radar fix on you. How bad you really are. Mm -hmm. And so I believe that this is hardwired in all of us as humans that we have the ability to be very very spiritually. Uh, decent and wonderful creatures, but we also have in each one of us the ability to be really criminal. Right. And so this that's why I think it's hardwired in us because the people who are running the government are just human like you are. They do they, they live the way you do. They don't they don't live the way you do, but they live human lives right. and therefore when they're tempted with money and sex and drugs and do anything they want to do and get away with it because the system protects them, uh, then they're going to do. They're going to fall into it. And it's not their fault. I know, <clears throat> I believe that people who are involved in organized crime <clears throat> are caught in it like a trap. Mm -hmm. you, you, you get a little something uh, that the that the organization the the outfit wants to give you they make it easy on you to get something to get the house you want they make it easy for you to get the new car you want they make it easy for you to pay your bills you got the money you got the protection and before you know it they gave you something now you got to give them something right and they and the, and the way the government works there's a law that says Anything the U.S. government finances, it owns. Right. So if you have a big corporation and you are, and they they can they can tax you out of business. The federal government can put you out of business very easy. They can find something that you put on your income tax, and they can take it, your business away from you. And now they own your business. And because they own your business, now they can decide. Uh, you know how that business is going to be run, and all the money goes to them because they took it from you. <clears throat> That's the way the big railroads 
caught on. That's the way big big time banks and insurance companies work is because government comes in and ruins those companies and now because those companies were so important they needed the, the government needs those companies they need those big corporations and so they will come in and fi- finance and give them a ba- a ba- uh, they'll bail them out what do you mean bail them out? Anything the government bails out, it owns. That's according to the maritime law. Anything the government will finance, they own it. They're not your partners. You right. were broke and they bought it. And well, so they, and they can buy it because they make the money. They've got the money to do it, and right. you don't. Right. And as we get ready to go to break, Jordan, you know, you know what the overall point is here? And, and I want you to correct me if I'm wrong with a very short answer after I say what I'm going to say. And then we're going to go to break here because we've been on for almost an hour. Seems like we're talking about gangsterism. But trust me, we are talking about gangsterism and we're talking about religion at the same time. <laughs> yes. Uh, yep. and, and Jordan is going to make that very clear. I do believe in the next hour. But here, here's the point of what we just discussed as far as I'm concerned concerned um you have sat down to some sat down and eaten with and broken bread with or had meetings with some very interesting people in the course of your lifetime some of them rather powerful some of them maybe morally questionable uh on occasion and as have i um but i've got to tell you that although i don't have quite the uh, amount of acquaintances that you do <laughs> or the array of acquaintances that you do i can tell you this uh without any hesitation in my mind, in my spirit, in my gut, in my heart, no matter where you want to put it, I know I'm correct when I say this. I've sat down next to and with and talked to and eaten with and all that individuals that you would generally consider to be rather bad people that certainly have body counts <laughs> attached yep. to them uh, that are stone-cold gangsters. That's who they were. And I'll tell you this much. Um, I do not weigh them on the same moral scale. Somebody who is responsible for the death of 10, 12 people, a couple dozen people maybe, in most cases other criminals for the most part, <laughs> okay? I, I, I don't weigh them on the same moral scale. I'm not saying they're good people. I'm saying I do not weigh them as heavily on the moral scale as the individuals who are literally responsible for sending tens of thousands of people to their death for the sake of an agenda, for the sake of profit, for the sake of orders given to them by the higher ups. Mm -hmm. And that is the point of why I make a differentiation between the generally accepted idea about organized criminals and these individuals who I, I, I feel as though I need to say they're like super organized criminals and they're more yeah. efficient. They're responsible for a lot more death, a lot more destruction, a lot more horror. And again, I stand by my statement. Sometimes when you pay the local gangster for your store not to be burned down or burglarized, it doesn't happen. <laughs> you pay the government constantly. You have no assurances. No, okay. None. So, none. you know, I, I, I feel quite satisfied making that statement. Jordan, am, am I, you know, I, I realize I'm splitting hairs here to some people on, on the moral scale. But to me, there is something to be said for individuals who, you know, do business and do uh, obviously immoral business. And for those that do it on such a large scale. That it's almost unimaginable. I mean, just to say that someone is responsible for 10,000 deaths. I ask the listener in your mind right now, have you literally physically met 10,000 people that you could name or that you know or that you've encountered in the course of your lifetime? Uh, not, not, not saying have you been in a room with 10,000 people. That's easy. But ha- have you actually interacted with 10,000 people? So, when you're trying to quantify the idea that tens of thousands of individuals who you will never see, never know, never care about, uh, you can comfortably and sleep well at night, be able to order their deaths, their destruction, their starvation, so on and so forth. I feel as though that is a slightly different level of evil from, well, gee, I sent my lackey to kill someone or I put a bullet in someone's head. 
it just seems to me to be a slightly different level of evil. And uh, not saying that the other guy who did that directly is not evil. Not saying that killing one man for the sake of profit or ego or whatever else is something that is not evil in any way, shape, or form. It is. It is truly evil. But to say that it is on the same level as these mass murderers, let's be honest, that's what you would call them if you were looking at this subjectively and you were just trying to quantify how much murder is being committed. Um, it, it seems to me as though there is a significant difference between the two. Jordan, do, do you think I'm wrong for thinking that? No, I think that is very reasonable, and, and this is the way I would look at it, too. I don't see the same kind of criminality in the ordinary man. I see criminals who are capable of killing people, but I also see those same kind of people going into political power mm-hmm. and using their political power to do the same kind of thing, get their way by killing people, get their way by buying you off or blackmailing you. you know, they get, politicians get their way with you by you agreeing to go along with them. You, they trick you into signing papers and trick you into doing things that you didn't know what you were doing because they didn't tell you. Because why? Because they they run the system, and they know that you don't know. It's called legalese. There's mm-hmm. a big difference between something which is legal and something which is lawful. There's a big difference between lawful and legal. Lots of things are very legal, but they're unlawful. According to mankind's understanding of law, a lot of stuff which is legal you can do are not lawful. Mm-hmm. There's a big difference. And so I understand what you're saying. I totally agree with you. There is different amounts of guilt depending on the circumstances and who did it and how they did it. And, and right. I think the law looks at it that way also, supposed to. Well, it's supposed this, to, right? Right. <laughs> now, yeah. that's another subject. But look, the subject at hand is religion. And again, some people might think they've gotten away from that topic. Now, the Ocelli event begins a little late here at Ocelli.com. But either way, you are listening to a remarkable discussion with the great Jordan Maxwell. And you can follow up on this by going over to Jordan Maxwell Show. Dot com. Yes, all three of those words together, jordanmaxwellshow.com, uh, and go and continue on with your studies, not only through the public section, which is available right there, but also because there is a research society in which you can get deeper into the subject being discussed tonight, as well as a great many other things connected to it, interlocking really like a panopticon of weaponry turned upon us all by those who are actually the owners. You can do that by taking a look at the monetary policy, governments, how they were created, selected, continue to operate, so on and so forth. When it comes to the language itself that we are speaking at this moment, this, quote, English, end quote, language, all of that kind of good stuff, you can delve into those subjects there. And also just take a look at Jordan's work in general, in addition to the fact that now there's a couple of videos over there which for a couple of dollars you can directly stream instantaneously to your device or your computer, whatever, and watch them from the comfort of your home without having to order them and have a DVD delivered and whatever else. And those things come direct from the only website, which is actually Jordan Maxwell's. That would be jordanmaxwellshow.com. Explore it. Go over there. Email Jordan. There's a link there to contact. You can email Jordan uh, at all times. He's happy to see that. Make a donation at all times. He's appreciative of that. And you can participate in what is going on. And uh, we, we, we need to appreciate individuals like Jordan because... Uh, unfortunately, he has less days in front of him than behind him. I don't say that in an insulting way in any shape or form, Jordan. I simply say it because I think people need to appreciate individuals who are great teachers while they are still alive and not just simply give me the eulogies about how great they were and then talk about how they wish they could do something for them now. You're still here with us. Unlike Stan Lee, who we talked about in the first hour a bit, 
Jordan is still here, so you can support him, interact with him, and go to his website at Jordan Maxwell Show. Dot com. So, Jordan, we spent a lot of time on gangsterism in the first hour, and some people might say, oops, they've gone off of the religious reservation, so to speak. Um, <laughs> not at all. In fact, gangsterism is, well, part of the operating principles behind that which we call religion, in my estimation. I mean, works kind of the same way. And, I was told yeah. that by an FBI agent in San Diego. M- many years ago, I got a phone call from an FBI uh, agent in San Diego, and he gave me his name, said he was an agent in, in the FBI. And I said to him, I said, I wrote his name down, and I said, I'll call you back. I have to go now. And so I, uh, we, we hung up. And then I call information and got the uh, uh, the telephone number for the FBI office in San Diego. They gave that to me. I called that number, and it was the FBI. And then I asked for him, and they put me through to him. And when he came on the line, I said, okay, now talk to me, because I now know you are FBI. And he said, I just wanted to call and tell you that we – like what you are doing we like hearing you and that we appreciate the work that you're doing but we want to tell you that i i want to tell you that if you have any problem it's not going to be with your government it's going to be with the churches they are they he said the fbi know we know we're not saying it publicly but we know the churches are actually criminal organizations they make millions and millions of dollars. They pay no taxes, and they have control over the minds of multiple millions of people. So they can direct them to vote a certain way and act a certain way. And that is that is a very powerful presence on the earth. If you can control millions of people and make nothing but money off of them as a corporation and pay no taxes, that obviously smells like a, a, a criminal racket. And he said, so we know in the FBI that churches are actually uh, tools in the hands of gangsters. We know that. So if you're going to have any problem in your life doing what you do, it's not going to be from your government. It's going to be from religion. Mm-hmm. The churches are going to find you to be uh, unacceptable. And he says, so just be aware of that. Don't think of the churches as, as you know, meek and mild operations. We know what they are. They are criminal organizations. And I'm just setting. I'm just giving you a heads up on what's coming for you in the future. Right. So, and re- reading from the work of uh, people like Peter Lavinda, uh, mm-hmm. you, you get a you get a serious grasp of exactly how deep and dark some of those holes might go when you want to become a rabbit That's and go right. down them. <laughs> That's right, right? And, and also uh, not only Peter Lavenda, who is absolutely sensational. I love Peter Lavenda. Got everything he's ever done. I have it all. But also uh, uh, Joseph Farrell. Joseph Farrell is another person you have to listen to because this man is is off the charts as far as I'm concerned. The most brilliant mind I've come across in years. Joseph Farrell, F-A-R-R-E-L-L. I would suggest people go on the web to YouTube and type in Joseph Farrell, F-A-R-R-E-L-L, and listen to anything he's talking about, no matter what it is, just listen to him, and you tell me if this is not one of the most brilliant minds that America has going for it today. Joseph Farrell is... It can be a very frightening, the stuff he talks about, because he knows what he's talking about. He's got the credentials to prove it. And I'm telling you, when he gets into the Roman religion and the Roman governments and the secret societies of banking fraternities and the families that run those those banking consortiums in Europe and where they came from and how they gave birth to the criminal elements of, of uh, the European Union and the connections with the Nazi Party and the Nazi International 
uh, it's an incredible story, Joseph Farrell. Mm. And, and I, I love listening to him. And, and I also want to acknowledge that during the break, we did get an email uh, in at Ocelli.com, info at Ocelli.com. And uh, it does state that uh, they, they thought you were talking about Frederick Nietzsche or Nietzsche, depending on how you pronounce it. I'm not sure which is proper, but uh, I've certainly read a lot of uh, what he's had to say regarding totalitarianism and yep. You know, his current situation when he was alive, all of that, and uh, people debate it now. Now, obviously, totalitarian governments had adopted things that Nietzsche said and uh, turned them around and repurposed them to justify some of their activities. But uh, what, what do you, is that the uh, but that's, philosopher that was you were? exactly who I was thinking of. Yes, that's who I was thinking of, Nietzsche. Mm. Uh, Nietzsche was one, was the one I had in mind. I just couldn't remember his name at the time. Right. I want to thank Sam for, for emailing that in. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, you were correct. You, you had another philosopher possibly in mind, but you nailed it the first time out uh, with the first yeah. one you mentioned that Jordan uh, uh, had in mind when he was saying that. And yeah. there, there's a great deal of study to go through with uh, Nietzsche's or Nietzsche's discussion uh, regarding totalitarianism and the spread of ideas, uh, yeah. you know, and how it was going to unfold and how it was actually unfolding uh, during his time when he was alive. Uh, so, you know, I, I think you would uh, uh, suggest to people that they should study carefully uh, what Nietzsche is saying and uh, what he means by it. <laughs> yeah. Because yeah. people what, have adopted what was... it for various purposes, right, Jordan? Yep, that's exactly right. Nietzsche was very, very incredibly interesting guy with a lot of strange uh, and wisdom and knowledge into the the life of mankind and how we act and how we operate on the earth and, and what's going on in the criminal element of the society and how governments really work. Uh, I was very impressed with uh, Nietzsche's work. Mm. And uh, and there was another man that was heavily involved in the occult religions during the 1800s. I I, I can't remember his name. It was a, I've, I've come across it many times. I can't remember his name, but he said in one of his writings, he said that there will come a time when America and the government, the federal government of America, will slowly but surely begin to clamp down on information. It will it will come. It won't be so obvious to everyone, but it will it will show itself. And you will see it. There will come a time when the U.S. government will slowly but surely begin to operate to dumb down the citizens and to and to shut down all uh, uh, portals of knowledge and, and, and important information will be shut down by the U.S. federal government because they do not want the people thinking too much. It's a very difficult situation for them. If it, how would you like to call yourself an absolute fira, an absolute dictator in a land of people with 150 IQs? You, uh, if you got a country in which uh, the whole country is highly educated, highly intelligent, and extraordinarily brilliant people in the country. And you're going to come out and tell, and you're going to call yourself an absolute dictator, and you don't even have a high school education. <laughs> and how are you going to be an absolute dictator and frighten the people when the people are far smarter than you will ever be? They're far more advanced than you possibly could ever be. And so that's why the powers that be in the U.S. government want to keep people ignorant. So. They will look like they are intelligent compared to the people, and uh, and it's true. That's exactly right. Um, Admiral Rickover, if he was a, one of the famous admirals in the U.S. Navy, when Admiral Rickover retired because he was such a celebrated figure in the military of this country, when he retired, sixty minutes did an interview with Admiral Rickover. And and I recall they said to him, 
the, the host on 60 Minutes said to Admiral Rickover, he said, Admiral, it has been said here in Washington that you are one of the most brilliant minds U.S. military has ever had. You are an extraordinarily genius. And Admiral Rickover smiled, and he said, well, I thank you for saying that. It's very kind, but that's not true. It's really not true. He said uh, it, the, the actual fact of the matter is that the people in the U.S. government are so damn ignorant and ill-informed and just downright stupid that anybody who has a half a brain looks like a genius to them. And he says, so that's the real, that's the real story. I'm not the genius that everybody's saying I am. It's just that I had an education. I learned how to think and read. And uh, so if you think at all and you use your mind at all, you look like a genius to the, the people of America and to the government of America because the government of America is so profoundly corrupt and stupid. So that's the name of that tune. Mm. And so that's why I'm saying that's why I I feel the same thing that the, the the government of this country is so corrupt it keeps the people ignorant, and ill-informed, and unread. It wants the people to be ignorant and ill-informed, so they really can't think to do anything. I said to you before, all we can do in this country is is cry and complain about the conditions. We can we can rant and rave about the conditions we live under, and how terrible it is. Uh, but there's nothing you can do about it. Spell D O. Nothing you can do about it. Why? Because you don't have the power to do anything about the situation you live under. And so the reason why you don't have the power is because knowledge is power. If you really understand thoroughly how a criminal operation is operating, you're not going to be taken in by it, and you're not going to be fooled by it and deceived by it, and you're not going to think they are your friends. They're going to know who they are and what they're doing, and this is going to protect you intellectually and spiritually protect you from the criminals if you really know how the world actually works. And that's what I've been trying to do is call to the attention of people around the world that governments are as corrupt as you could be, as you could be. They are already that corrupt. Mm. And, that, and that the only way you're going to be able to do anything about the world you live in is if you know how it works. If you don't know how something works, you can't fix it. And don't look to the people who have screwed the world up to fix it. If they could have fixed it, they would have fixed it already. The mere fact that it's so far gone now shows that the people in power do not have the power to change anything because they are the criminals themselves. So, well, you know, Jordan, th this is an interesting time to drop in the latest live feedback for the uh, for the discussion we're having tonight. I think it is apropos that we do so. Uh, and, yep. and I'm going to read it now that this is Brian's words, not mine, but I'm not telling you I disagree with it. Um, so uh, here we go. Please ask Jordan if statism should be also recognized as a religion. It seems like the government just has a good story, just like the church does, and therefore wants you to appeal to authority and only give over your personal rights and privileges to their control. I, I'm sorry about the way it's worded. I'm just reading it. Well, uh, no, but I'm telling you, I understand that I understand the concept completely. I said absolutely correct. This is precisely the way it works. Because if you go back into history, the leaders of different nations were always understood not just to be the king, but they were also the connection with the people to their God. The kings always represented their God, just like the Queen of England and the King of England supposedly is the protector of the faith, the protector of the Christian faith. And the most unchristian thing on the earth is the British royalty. They are the most unchristian 
inhuman, fascist, Nazi, murdering bunch of criminals the world has ever, ever experienced. And yet they are the protectors of the church. They're the protectors of the faith. And so it's absolutely true that uh, government operates on the people's minds just like religion. Uh, government is a religion. As a matter of fact, I think I said that a long time ago on one of the programs we did. Yeah. My mother used to tell me there's never been a religion in the world that wasn't political. And there's never been a political situation on the earth that wasn't a little religious. Religion and politics is one of the same operation. It's right. the same idea. Control the people. Right, and if you think this is a European issue or a Roman issue, again, I direct you to the idea that the Egyptians did the very same thing. Uh, after all, the Pharaoh was also, well, a god or That's connected right. to God or the son of a god. And in various cultures, mm-hmm. right, the various rulers, why is it even let's let's totally go outside of it for a second in, in North Korea. Uh, literally at this point in time, Jordan, in a technical sense, there is a dead man who is the head of the government. Uh, yeah. Kim Jong-un is not technically the head of the government, but because of the godlike status of his grandfather, <laughs> he uh-huh. is the head of the government because his family is in that godlike position. You see, and and kings and queens, all sorts of royalty have done this over time. Of course, the European royalty is easy to study, but we, we, we find that this is something which is, you know, again and again, a repetitious template in history that the ruler does not simply rule by force, does not simply rule by generosity, does not simply rule by trickery uh, of, of you know, just keeping the masses out of the equation entirely, but by adopting this idea, cloaking themselves in the shroud of allegedly being a god, a godlike figure, or the son of a god, so on and so forth. And the interesting part about that, Jordan, is that, you know, I could have swore that many years ago in mainstream psychology I read, and I'm sure we could read it again and find it right now on the Internet in a 100,000 places, that um, this is specifically the formula by which religious, quote, cults, end quote, are also formed, Um, not arguing with the fact that that is the template, but is it not exactly the same template by which governments, these churches, these That's different right. stories, uh, so on and so on. I mean, about. it's the same mm-hmm. thing, right? That's exactly right. That's okay. exactly how governments come about. They get enough followers, and the followers are promoting it, and they pick up more followers, and, uh, and eventually it grows to be a very powerful presence, and it becomes uh, in a position where they can take over the political control over an area and they become known as a government <clears throat> and the government is made up of cultists or cultists made up of simple people who want more power who want to control other people and they they run for office and the people elect them and they and they they now have the political power that they wanted and now they want to take over the government, and then they'll kill each other. They, they will infighting where they don't mind killing a president as they did with John Kennedy and his brother and Martin Luther King and all the other political assassinations. People who want political power will kill for it. <clears throat> and this is why today uh, people will die for their religion. <clears throat> the Islamic world don't do not mind going out and dying for their their spiritual beliefs, and mm. that brings us back to religion. I mean, well, right. Why? One last one last commentary here that was entered into the live show, and I want to go directly to where your thought process was after this. But really quickly, I want to let you know that a listener said, and this is not a question. This is a comment, but I think uh, one that I'd like you to hear. Uh, it just occurred to me that there has been no leadership that one can find in history that does not have the God element, God is in quotes, God element 
entered into the equation. They are chosen by God or anointed or possibly they justify themselves in a moral sense, and moral is also in quotes, based on the ideas behind a loosely uh, a, a loosely understood religious faith. In other That's words, right. all mm-hmm. leaders who ascend to high power seek to keep it and justify what they do by a God-like intervention. I don't know if intervention is the right word, but I agree with the sentiment, Jordan. What do you say? Of course. That's why the kings of Europe will tell you that they have a divine right to rule. What do you talk about a divine right? Divine implies God has given you the right to rule over your nation. So you have a divine right. What do you talk about divine? Well, you talk about the Pope. The Pope is the father. He's the great, uh, he's your, uh, the Holy Father. And he, why? Because he talks with God. He's the Godfather. Mm-hmm. And the Godfather has appointed you to be, uh, uh, the, appointed you to be the president or the royalty or the, whatever your position in royalty is, that's papal. The papacy will, will back you in wh- whatever you say you are. The papers, they put you there. They allow you to be there, the Holy Father. And that's why if you're royalty, you better drop in and go on your knees and see the Pope and bow down and kiss his ring. Because if he decides that you are getting too uppity and you're thinking too much of yourself, he might make a decree that you are a heretic. And he doesn't want you in the in place of government. And that way, the people will turn against you instantly. So, well, and this is all about so a hierarchy, which, uh, which again, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt one last time, but I know you want these things brought right to your attention. Uh, this is about a hierarchy, which uh, somebody does talk about here briefly, and I think we should do a future show just generated from this question. Uh, given that uh, Veterans Day has just passed, and the idea of military organizations. Uh, being like, excuse me, be, yes. being like religious organizations, it seems that they are also the same. This is, this is the, uh, uh, thing. I, I think that is worthy of discussion for a full two hours, Jordan. The idea I think that, it is uh, too. I think there's a lot about that that needs to be said. Mm. That's gone on too long. And this is why, you know, we, we are in, we are involved in buying into, that's why I said to you before, uh, that, that it's propaganda. And propaganda does not deceive you. Propaganda helps you to deceive yourself. And it plays on your, it plays on your emotions. They use terms in the government like support our boy. Mm-hmm. You know, you know they, we support our boys in a war. And I've said so many times, you go into a bar in San Diego in the, in the Navy district, you go into a bar, you see a bunch of guys there you know, with a beer at the bar, and you go over and say, hey, boy, and call him a boy. You know, you and you will find out. They're going to tell you, "Hey, how big do men get where you come from, son?" Calling me a boy, mm-hmm. you better back out of. You better back off. I'm not a boy. And then you find out, no, they're grown men who are trained to defend themselves. They carry guns. They're not a boy. So if you want to support the troops, well, that's one thing. But don't call them our boys because they're not a boy. You go to a if you go to a basketball game of teenagers, or go to a little league baseball club, then you're supporting your boys. Right. But you're not supporting boys when you go out and talk about support our boys, the troops. They're not boys. They're grown men. They're, they've been taught and trained to kill. They are military men. Mm. So give me all that crap about well we support our boys. That's our boys. I'm so sick and tired of hearing that kind of politician rhetoric, all that uh, politicians' terms that you know that they 
they get you involved in, and now you feel like, oh yeah, well I'm supporting our boys. There's no, it's just a very sad situation how governments manipulate our thinking and how churches have been. Churches and religion are based on natural things which we have lived with all of our lives as long as humans have been on the earth. There are certain things we all understood and those ideas that we've all lived with for thousands of years have been put into stories so that we can now live with those stories that teach us what we've always known. This is why today, in religion, in the Western world, God is a man. He's called God the Father. Why is God the Father? Mm. Well, because of the rain that comes in the summer and the spring. The spring rains is why we call God the Father, is because of spring rains. And why? Why is that? Because in the ancient world, the peoples understood that the connection between humans procreating, having children, having offspring, uh, and how the earth has offspring. All the animals have offspring in the spring. Uh, offspring meaning that the animals reproduce themselves. The plants reproduce themselves. Everything comes alive and is alive, it reproduces itself in the spring. Why? Because of the rains that come. Mm. And so the rain, rain was considered to be the sacred fluid that would impregnate Mother Earth, Mother Nature. Mother Nature woke up in the spring, and plants began to, uh, to reproduce themselves, the flowers coming out, the animals coming out and reproducing themselves. So spring was a time for reproduction. And how did the how did the earth mother earth and mother nature reproduce herself? With the spring rains, the holy fluid that came from God the Father to impregnate Mother Earth. Mm. And this is why uh, you know that from there you can go into if you want to be born again, as the Christians call it, to be born again. You have to go back into your mother's water because when you were born, you, you her, her water broke and you came out to life. So if you want to be born again and come out to a new life, you have to go back into your mother's water. What do you mean your mother's water? Your mother nature, mother earth. Go right. back into the lake and it's her water. And you go under the water and you come out. And now you are a new life. You are a new person. You've been born again. You come out of your mother's water. Right. And these terms all tie together rather well. The ancient terminology and the more modernized version of it, you hear them talking about the seed of someone. Uh, literally, people do not create seeds so to speak, I mean, right. not, not a seed like you would see in an agricultural sense, but That's the seed right. of, and, uh, the, you know, speaking about water, of course, we've heard Jordan discuss the birth canal and exactly all of those interesting tech, you know, uh, uh, words that are utilized in order to give you an idea of what's happening. So when you're talking yeah. about the spring rains and uh, th this idea of fluid and all of that, it was a rudimentary understanding of the process now sure over time we learn differently but uh you know that that rain in and of itself is a life giver it's not That's necessarily right. the seed of life but it is certainly essential to the process which is why water is never forgotten and we do recognize that water makes up the majority of this planet's surface and we realize that everything that that lives on it requires water so water is an interconnected thing and uh this is why water is also utilized in these different ceremonial um presentations like you were talking about you're, you're being born again you're immersed in water just like you were immersed in the womb and you That's were right. literally surrounded by fluid i mean in a scientific sense i'm not trying to be graphic about it i'm just stating a fact here in a scientific sense you know you're you're in the what what some people describe as embryonic fluid which right. uh, is made up of a lot of water actually uh, yes, there's blood, which is a separate liquid from water, but 
blood and water do go together rather nicely, and there's other fluids in there that are not necessarily water. But altogether, how would you understand this in a general sense as water, as fluid, as liquid? That's right. You so, came down yeah. the birth canal. Right. And, uh, and, and your mother, her water broke, and you came out to life. This is why all ships, sailing ship and rocket ships, or any kind of a ship is referred to as she. All ships on the earth are female. And the captains will always tell you that she's a good ship and she's very seaworthy and she's this and she's that. What do you mean she? It's because of, because of a ship is referred to as female because she transports the, the, she delivers the product. The product comes through her. And so the ship is a female and it, wherever the ship piles into port and wherever it parks, it's at a berth. It's called B-E-R-T-H. A berth is where a ship sits. And everything that the ship is giving, taking off board, taking off the ship to be sold, has to have its own certificate of manifest. Because yesterday the ship wasn't here, but this morning when we go to work on the dock, the ship is here. It came in last night on the water. So it's a... And the ship is sitting in her berth. And so everything coming out that ship has to have its own certif certificate. And so we call it a birth certificate. Well, when you were born, you have to have a birth certificate. And it's got to be signed where? It's got to be signed by the dock. The dock has to sign your birth certificate. And therefore, you are now an international maritime admiralty product. You come into this world uh, in water, so you are a maritime product, and your body is 78% water. So on the New York Stock Exchange, your body is being bought and sold as a commodity. You are a security on the, on the stock market. And as long as you do, your, you do your work well and you pay your taxes, then the community that you live in prospers. And the governmental arrangement over that community prospers and everybody is happy. And everybody has a nice life living in the community. Because why? Because you do your job well. And as long as you are a security on the stock exchange, which your body is a security on the New York Stock Exchange, then we say if you got a son and he's marrying a, a girl that comes from a very rich, a very wealthy family, we say, well, she's of good stock. Or the girl, your daughter's getting married to a young man who comes from a very wealthy family, and we say, well, he's of very good stock. He's of stock. And I'm thinking, what, your daughter's marrying a cow? No, he's, he's, a, he's of very good stock, meaning that's how he is viewed. His body is a stock on the stock market, but it's a very wealthy stock. You are a common stock. <laughs> if you're not a millionaire, you're just a common stock. But the, the problem is, is that you are considered to be a stock on the stock exchange. And that's why you, when you buy a house, it has a backyard because your children play in the backyard. It's a stockyard. Your children and you are considered to be a stock on the New York Stock Exchange. And this is why when you, when you do your work well, you make a lot of money and you're paying taxes and you're paying into your community, you're putting money back into the community, uh, and therefore you are, you know, you're, you're continually to uh, give security to the, to the community in which you live. So you're a good stock and you are... You are security to the stock exchange. This is why when you finally retire, which usually means you're going to bed, you're going to retire, uh, you are now getting a, a, a token from what you have put into the system all your life. You're going to get something called social security. Why? Because it's just a little dividend of the money that you have had to pay to stay alive and raise your children and feed your family, you had to pay out money every day. That's why your money is called currency. 
It's like an ebb in the flow of the current. It all flows in and it flows back out. It flows in and it flows back out. So your money is a security on the stock exchange. You are. Your body is a security for the corporation. And so when you retire, you get social security. Mm -hmm. Why? Because you are the security for the body social. The body social is called a corporation. This is why you are a corporation. You are a business. And what you do, like I said to you before, if I see you come out of a restaurant one night at 2 o'clock in the morning with some woman, and I say to you the next day when we're talking privately, I said, you know that woman you were with last night, she's bad company. And you tell me, mind your own business. Business, company, and then I find out you're going to get married and she's going to be your partner. So what are we talking about here? Partners, business company and then you find out no the whole of life is a business just like the movie uh, network said many years ago 30 years ago 40 years ago there was a movie called network and the one of the characters in the movie explained to another one that here's the way the world works the earth is a business and so it's a business, it's a corporation, a one big world corporation. And all governments are corporations, they are businesses and corporations. They've been and been incorporated through the original corporation, which was the Vatican, under the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire developed the idea of corporations. And so today all the countries in Europe that were under the Caesars of Rome are referred to as corporations. And the United States is a privately owned corporation. It's a municipal corporation that was incorporated in 1870. How many people know that? You're not living in the United States of America. That's why we don't call each other Americans. We don't call each other Americans. We're not Americans. Americans were uh, was a particular kind of people living under the United States of America in 1776. After the Civil War, we're not no longer Americans. We are U.S. citizens. U.S. is a term for a corporation, a company was formed called the United States Company, the United States Corporation. And each one of us is an employee of that corporation, and we are referred to as United States citizens. You're not a citizen of America. You're not an American. This is why when you go into court, you cannot bring up the, you cannot say anything in a court about your citizen. You are a citizen of the United States of America. No, you're not. You are a U.S. citizen. Mm. United States incorporate as a corporation go on the web and look up the word United States is a corporation and listen to all the professors and all the experts on the subject of international law and find out that the United States is simply Washington D.C. and the few islands that it controls it has nothing to do United States has nothing to do with the 50 states of the Union. It has nothing to do with us at all. And so you need to know how governments work. The United States government is a corporation. It's a business. And this is why if you're going to get married, you've got to have a license because you are, you are a corporation. You're going to do business. So you've got to have a business license. You're, the, the girl you're marrying is a business, and you are a business. Thank God you get married as none of my business. You know, but who I sleep with is none of your business. Right. The idea is, is that humans are a business. We are a company. This is why you could say he's good company or she's bad company. Because why? Because it's a business. You need to understand the foundations on which your life exists today. You don't understand how the world really works. That's why you have courts. That's why you have police. You have police because they enforce the policies of the corporation. 
corporations cannot make law. They can only have a policy. And so seers can decide what they want to do with their business, and it's not the law of God. They don't make the law of the land. No, it's just a company, it's just a corporation. And so they have certain things they call their laws that they live by, their corporation operates under. And it's not a law, because corporations are not in, empowered to make laws. But they do have their operation. They do do the things they want to do with their company. It's called a policy. Mm. So the company has a policy. And so the United States has a policy. And so to make sure you follow that policy, they have police. They enforce policy. To, by, by who? By politicians make up the policy and it's backed up by the armed police, which gives us our word police, policy, politicians. It all goes back to the whole idea of the world is right. a corporation. It's a business. Well, as we come to just about the close of episode 14 here in this uh, series of discussions on religion, this one might have been a little less conventional uh, than uh, than people might have expected because we spent a great deal of time on things like Stan Lee and gangsterism and uh, exactly what criminal organizations behave like and exactly how different or alike they are to the governmental organizations. One might wonder something, and I do have a, a, a piece of feedback here. I'm going to just throw at you before we close out. Uh, but before I do that, I want to remind people that they need to go to Jordan Maxwell Show. Dot com Jordan Maxwell show dot com all together one word uh, because that is the only website which is Jordan Maxwell's and of course join the research society over there examine all of this and uh, and and many more topics which are relevant tied to it and related to it in such a way that you you can't hardly tell one from the other quite honestly because it's all connected Um but all of that, including the language, the monetary system, the way that the justice, in quotes, system behaves, all of these things are examined in depth in your research society, which um, <clears throat> people can get to by going to jordanmaxwellshow.com. There's a button there for the research society and also these videos, which are now streaming over there. I figure you're going to add a couple more soon, but there's just a few over there that you can get direct from Jordan Maxwell himself. So that's, you know, usually you go to the source when you want to go to the source, right? Well, that is the only website where you get the source that we know as Jordan Maxwell, jordanmaxwellshow.com. Um, this piece of feedback is a very general, very large question, and uh, who knows if you'll be able to capsulize it quickly, but Jordan... Uh, the the question I think is valid, although it is extremely broad. Is there a way out of all of this? Is uh, the question in general? I mean, because uh, the listener who's named Daniel does wish to seek a silver lining, understands a great many things that you have talked about over the years. I happen to know who this is personally, and I know that they have spent probably hundreds of hours listening to you easily. I mean, I'm probably underestimating it, but I but I can say without question that he spent hundreds of hours listening to you and uh, uh, grasping uh, what it is you are presenting. And uh, I guess that question right there is, there, is there a way out? Is there some sort of solution to all of that which is confronting the human family at this time. I mean, here we go. Ready for pressure, guys? You listening out there? I give Jordan Maxwell a couple of minutes to answer that question before we're done. <laughs> but uh, but it's a valid yes. question, Jordan, isn't it? It's a very important question, yes. And I am saying that I don't believe there is a way out. I know that there are things that you can do. There are a couple of documents on my research society uh, website there's under interesting articles there's a couple of articles right there on the very first uh, on the very first page of interesting articles on my research site that are so extraordinary so incredible that a, a way that you can walk away from government period but you don't necessarily want to do that you can walk away from government 
and government can uh, has nothing ever to do with you ever again. There is a way to do that, but it's not something you want to do. I would do not advise it at all. Because when you walk away from government, you have walked away from the world you live in. There's no more going to a bank, no more getting a job, no more paying bills, no more driving a car, no more of that, none of it. You might as well get yourself in a canoe or a boat and go to an island in the South South Pacific and live on the island all by yourself, period. And whatever happens to you there, no matter what happens, you're by yourself and you're on your own forever. That's what will happen if you walk away from the society and the world in which we live. Everything is a business and you are, in, you are involved in a corporation. And so if you walk away from this world that we live in, you can do that. If you know how to do it in America, you can walk away from the government forever. And there's an article I found on the web that is so incredibly important and explains to you exactly who you are on the earth in America today. If you're in this country or if you're in, uh, living in, in a country in the Western world, there's an article that explains who you are and how, if you have to and you want to, you can walk away from Western civilization's government, period. And nothing can be done. You can walk away and nobody can touch you. So, yeah, there is there are ways that you can get out of the mess we're in, but you don't really want to do that because you cannot no longer work to get a job you can't do any banking. You can't do anything because you're no longer a part of the civilization that you're living in. You're no longer a part of it. They have nothing to do with you, and you've got nothing to do with them. And if you have a bad accident, no hospital will take you. Nobody will take you. Nobody will touch you, period. Why? Because you're not part of the system. Mm. And so... I say I don't think there's any way that mankind is going to be able to extricate himself out of the situation we're in. All I am suggesting that you want to do is educate yourself. Mm -hmm. At least understand how things work. Then you can maneuver yourself a lot easier as long as you understand. You, you're understanding something doesn't mean you're going to change it, but it does mean that you're smart now and you now learn how it works and what you can do, what you can't do, and how to live in the system better so that it doesn't touch you and it doesn't harm you. Education is the answer, and that's all I'm asking, and that's all I want to give. I'm not giving any advice as an attorney. I'm not a lawyer. Right, I'm right. not giving any advice. I'm just telling you the way the world really works. Well, in, in closing, I wanted you to know that Daniel replied with the comment uh, that it would be to be like Neo was in the movie The Matrix, where you learn to walk both inside and outside of the system simultaneously to... Uh, you know, create yep. some change, that would probably be the path that you would suggest, uh, is, is what I'm hearing from you. It seems like he got the, uh, he got the note there. And, uh, <laughs> I just wanted to say, yeah. I think that that's, that's exactly right. And, and I, I feel the same way. So, um, so what, what, what do you say about that, Jordan? Yeah, I think it's like, uh, what was it? Morpheus said, I'm just offering you the truth if you can handle it. There you go. Uh, I'm just offering it to you. If you want to know how you got into the mess you're in and how it works and what's really actually going on behind the scenes that you've never been told, then go to my website and join my research society and listen to what I've been trying to tell you for years. I've been doing this for almost 60 years now on radio That's and right. speaking to audiences around the world. I'm trying to wake the human race up to the fact that the world is not what you think it is. It doesn't work the way you think it does. Nothing is what you think it is. You th that's you exactly right. that's exactly correct, Jordan. And unfortunately, we're out of time here, but we're going to continue this series. 
because I think we're now getting into some really interesting areas. Not like the whole thing hasn't been interesting, but, you know, it, it just continues to get deeper.